Welcome back everyone to our IGTV series. Today we're here with our first video on sustainable finance, which is our new topic for the month of June. Uh, today we're sitting down with Professor Rob Bauer. He's a finance professor at the University of Maastricht. He does a lot of other things as well, but most importantly, he's a professor and he's here with us to talk about all things sustainable finance, of course. So let's just jump right into it. Thank you, Greta. It's so, so much fun to be here with a former student of mine in Maastricht. Yeah. Um, so, and, and good to see that you're active in this really strange times that we're in. I'm actually a finance prof, um, but already roughly 20 years ago, I got to, into the topic of sustainability. And I'm using that both in my finance professorship at the Maastricht University, but also I run a center in the University of Toronto called ICPM where pension funds across the globe meet and discuss these topics as well. So um, I'm trying to push the topic, not just uh, through uh, education, but also through investments. So now on to more technical questions. Uh, how would you say um, that sustainable sustainability and finance merge? And with that, could you give us a definition or an overview of what sustainable finance means? Yeah, so... Uh, Maybe I should go back to how it started for me, because that is sort of uh, the, the origin of it. I, was, uh, I always had two jobs. I always worked in a university and also in the industry to some extent. And at, at the time, I'm talking about the end of the 90s, I was working at an at a asset manager division of a large pension fund. And the topic came up, especially from an exclusion point of view. What companies should we not invest in from an ethical point of view? And I started looking at it and my finance education told me that's bad. Exclusion is bad, and a less efficient portfolio, worse risk adjusted returns, don't do it. That's what finance class told me. So and then I, I thought, let's, uh, let's have a look at this topic. And I did some research with some of my colleagues in, in Maastricht, uh, who, which actually showed that the conventional mutual funds, so investment vehicles, performed equally poorly as sustainable funds, there was no difference in return. Both bad because of high costs, different topic. Um, so I thought, hey, wait a minute, maybe there is a connection between the two that is different than I thought. It's not so bad to be a sustainable investor from a risk and return point of view. That's how I started. That paper got a lot of attention and suddenly we were, we were able to attract all kinds of funds uh, to do more research. And I think to, if you ask, what is the link? Uh, I think if you finance anything, so especially companies, but could also be something else, uh, it's not just a short-term decision you make. You have to think in the more longer term, you give money to a company, what are they gonna do with a company? So if you right now would give a lot of money to coal companies, you have to ask yourself, is this a viable business model? So even from that perspective, not, not even the sustainable uh, perspective, that could be a question. And of course, the same holds for any company in any dimension, even an IT company, for instance, could treat its personnel really poorly by paying lousy salaries or giving them too much to work a day. And in the end, in the long term, that will not lead to a great productivity by these personnel. So there's definitely a link. And that's, that's sort of started my, my academic interest in it roughly 20 years ago. So when you talk about this, um question that we ask we ask ourselves when we invest in a company I invest but what is the company going to do with my money in the long term what comes to mind is the term of impact investment which I know that you have researched um, so my question is uh, how do people view this impact investment are people actually um, do they actually want to invest sustainably or or not or what is the trend that you observe of course, if I ask University College Maastricht students uh, in the classroom, all of them want that, and I think you, you as well. Um, if, you, if you ask people generally, do you like sustainability, they will say, yes, of course, why not? It's, a, it's also a socially desirable answer. There's only a small group of people that doesn't. Um, but it's quite interesting. In the European Union right now, there's legislation <coughs> being prepared. Uh, I don't know whether you know that when uh, you're not in a stage of your life yet that you have like 50,000 euros and go to a private bank. But if you have that in a few years time and you start working, um, your bank has to ask you, how do you want to invest this from a risk perspective? So you fill in a form out of that European legislation. It says, 
you uh, have to have a portfolio that is consistent. The bank has to provide a portfolio to you consistent with your risk profile. Well, the same is happening on sustainability. There's legislation being prepared for in two or three years time now, that if you go to a bank with the same 50,000, you do not just have to fill in a risk profile, but also a sustainability profile. And then the bank has the duty to provide you with um, the, the a portfolio that is as sustainable as you want it to be. Then the question is, how do you measure that? So that's, that comes back to your question. Uh, I did some research uh, on that in, in the context of a pension fund. So pension fund, uh, has, uh, the, the fund that we looked at was the pension fund for the retail sector in the Netherlands. It had like hundreds of thousands of participants uh, in that fund. When we sent a letter to each one of them, uh, we got a quite big turnover response rate. And we did a, we did a sort of uh, analysis with them trying to prevent this social desirability bias and found that roughly 70% of the people really want sustainability in their pension investments. And so we, this is not a society, socially desirable answer. It's really what they want. We try to elicit the true preferences of these people. Only 10% said, no, I do not want that. And what was really striking, we also asked these people, uh, to have an expectation on whether they thought these, the returns of these investments would be bigger or lower or the same. And even those people, which was like 20%, who said, we think the returns are lower of these investments, still wanted it to happen. Mm -hmm. And that is really important. If you think about this a bit from a distance, we teach economic students and finance students that we all have a utility curve that says more money is better lower risk is, 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 is also better. So risk and return are the two things that we base our decisions on. But apparently there is something else that also influences our utility. For instance, in what world are we gonna live if we go into retirement? So if you have a lot of money, but the air is not, uh, not nice, you cannot profit from the money anyway. So people don't like that. And I think that is what this study shows. There's a huge demand for sustainability uh, more than policymakers actually think. Mm -hmm. And my next question uh, regards green bonds. Uh, how do green bonds fit into this picture? And maybe you could also explain what are green bonds for uh, our viewers that maybe are not familiar with the term. And normally, if you supply uh, uh, finance to a company through a bank, uh, you know you get your loan paid back, and that's it. And you don't care that much which type of company it is. Maybe uh, you, you will look at the quality of the governance and whether some unethical stuff is going on, but that's sort of it. In, in the context of a, of a green bond, and I think the World Bank is a good example, you give the money to uh, the World Bank and they make sure it is invested in a country, uh, in a project that is actually directly contributing to climate change mitigation type projects. And uh, so that way you get a return and uh, we solve part of the climate change problem that we have. So it's a combination. And the, the big discussion there is now, what type of return do you get out of that? Is it now the same as a regular bond? Is it more or is it less? And I think uh, there is a lot to say about any three of these statements. There is a lot of research going on right now. There's simply not enough data yet to say something decent about it. But if you had to ask me uh, to, to choose one of them, I would say they roughly have the same return. There's not a really big difference between normal bonds and green bonds. So then the question is, can you trust the intermediate organizations who you give the money to, to make sure that the money actually gets into a Moroccan, uh, for instance, field with uh, solar panels to help uh, uh, the climate change problem there? Uh, and I think, yeah, of course, the World Bank is certainly to be trusted. But there also are like topics coming up like corporate green bonds where companies promise to do that. But in order to check whether they are actually doing that, you need to have accountants that check whether what they do is true. So it's not so easy. So with regards to this, would you say that then um, to move towards a more sustainable finance and having more sustainable investments, the most pressing issue is this uh, lack of transparency. There needs to be more transparency or what, what, is it, what is it that we need to do to move to a more sustainable finance? I think uh, if you want to know more about this in detail, uh, um, uh, I think definitely would prefer you to the Sustainable Finance Action Plan of the European Committee. And they have like 10 big points, and one of them is transparency. 
disclosure requirements, not just for companies. So companies, of course, have to tell what they do, how much they emit, uh, but also uh, how they treat their personnel. So in, the, in a broad range of sustainability, uh, but also for investors. Investors are increasingly uh, also forced to tell what they do on the topic. So you cannot be an investor anymore, whether it's a pension fund or a private bank or an insurance company, it doesn't matter. And you say to the public, I don't tell you which investments I have or I don't tell you how I integrate sustainability. You're allowed to say, I don't do it, but then you have to write that, and that's not really a great marketing statement. So what you see is that all these investors are also trying to. This is just one issue of the Sustainable Finance Action Plan. There are like 10 in total. So there's also, for instance, one on benchmarking, creating a benchmark so that when you buy a product, you know it's a really a sustainable product if you buy it in an investment bank. And there are, are many more of those examples in the Sustainable Finance Action Plan. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I know that you're involved in creating this kind of benchmark. Um, is that correct? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, I've, uh, the University of Maastricht, uh, I have some colleagues, uh, Pete Eichels and Niels Koch, they're very much into uh, sustainable real estate. So they, they wrote an article some years ago about uh, green buildings and that gave us the idea to, to benchmark actually uh, the real estate investments across the globe, both the private investments like funds in which they invest in buildings or office buildings or residential homes or publicly listed uh, so-called REITs, real estate investment trusts, in which these same buildings are but they are then uh, uh, listed at the stock exchange and you can buy and sell them just like you can sell stocks. It's all real estate. And we were just wondering how do these real estate companies deal with the topic of sustainability, especially because real estate is roughly 40% of the CO2 emission. So what we create as heat in buildings to, to, eat, to be able to live in these buildings or air conditioning in, in Italy in the summer, uh, it costs a lot of energy and that's the, roughly 30 to 40% of the CO2 emission according to the real estate experts. So it makes a lot of sense. And a lot of investors were actually interested in that, but didn't have the data. And that's when Maastricht University did some first research, out of which this company called Grasby, it's the global real estate sustainability benchmark, emerged. And it's now a separate standalone company running, uh, running its own operations and actually became a, a, a world standard. So if you're interested in real estate, you should definitely have a look at that. And Looking at the situation we're living in today with COVID-19, uh, it's a very difficult situation for everyone. We're going to be hit by a huge economic crisis. Um, and how do you think that this situation will impact uh, investment decisions at large, but also with regards to sustainability? Yeah, that, that's of course a very important question. It's not so easy to answer. I mean, in times of crisis, we tend to look at the short term. And sustainability is a topic that you need to have a long-term lens for to, 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 to think it through. Because, you know, sustainability investments uh, are quite huge for companies or for whomever. And I just, two years ago, I got, uh, no, a year ago, I got solar panels on my roof. I had to put down a lot of money to get them on. And you remember, I was actually in the okay. question for you. And I had to put down a lot of money and I had to calculate, I could use corporate finance to check whether it makes sense. Uh, that's, that's the term that you're talking about 20 years or so. Um, whereas COVID-19, we're all thinking about tomorrow and when are the shops going to open and when is there a vaccine? It's all a year. A year. And then uh, companies, uh, I mean, I, I read an article, I think it was on Bloomberg uh, a few days ago. How on earth can analysts make any predictions about the value of a company right now because they don't know what the profit is going to be this year and they don't know what it's going to be next year. They have to assume that we go to some normal after that. So there is a huge uncertainty in, in the data. Uh, so I think that's, that's where, you, um, where you people that have a really short-term mind and do not look further than that, it's very tricky. You can make really weird decisions you might think we should not invest in sustainability anymore now and stop everything because we have to live tomorrow. I think it's not that bad. Uh, it's a big shock that we have uh, and we should definitely not go away from the path to deal with all the climate change problems that are emerging. Uh, but it will definitely hit some of these projects 
um, for instance, infrastructure projects are really in tough uh, uh, waters now because of this crisis. And maybe many of those infrastructure projects are related to sustainability solutions. So I think the crisis will definitely have an impact, just like it has an impact everywhere. It also has an impact on the sustainability projects. So these days, banks are really at the center of discussion with this crisis and everything. And uh, do you think that, or what do you think are the most effective ways that banks can kind of move to adopt um, a way that they can deal with more sustainability related issues? And could we see an emergence of sustainable only banks? And is, is that even something that people are thinking about right now? Yeah. So we have, um, in the Netherlands, we have two sustainable only banks. One bank is called the Triodos Bank and the other one is ASM Bank. So even if you put your savings account there or your simple salary account that you got, you know that the money is used for financing sustainable projects or uh, similar uh, stuff. Um, these are small banks, very small banks in relation to the Rabobank, ABN and all the other big banks. And I think same holds for some other countries where they have these sustainable only banks but in most countries they don't i also don't think that's the solution i think the solution is that every bank will have sustainability big on its uh, on its strategy and um, looking at that lots of banks already say they have you know they are very sustainable and they have a marketing campaign that's really huge and they have a sustainability department with 40 people and I think they also more and more, and the literature also shows that, academic literature, take into account sustainability as a risk factor. So if you're a bank and you lend money, you're especially interested in getting the money back. You're not so much interested in the upside potential because that's for the shareholders. You're especially interested in getting the money back. Um, but what the literature shows is that if companies, for instance, have really poor environmental practices and are therefore at a higher risk than the similar companies in the same sector, etc., then they charge higher interest rates. So they are already somehow pricing in the risk of sustainability. That's what they're doing. Uh, however, uh, take an example, the tobacco industry. There are still banks that are heavily financing the tobacco industry. Um, is that sustainable? Hmm, I question that. I think uh, the demand from the public is to not let them do that. Uh, financing the oil industry, uh, financing other uh, climate change, uh, uh, not climate change compatible activities. So I think banks really need to go back to the drawing board and come up with a strategy and, and ask themselves, who are our clients? And of course, the, the most important clients that they have are you and I. So the, the individuals that, they, that provide the money to the banks. It's sort of a similar discussion as the, as the pension fund discussion. They should check what their clients want. And I, I did some research actually uh, four or five years ago with the Triodos Bank and ASM Bank, these two Dutch sustainable banks. And uh, what it showed, I, I found quite interesting that if you have clients that also socially identify with yourselves, sort of a behavioral study it was, so if you have the same view on sustainability as the bank, you tend to be a more loyal customer. So it's also in the interest of the bank to make sure they know their clients on this topic. So a lot of things happening. I think the knowledge base of banks on this topic is, is totally uh, 10 years behind academics. So it takes some time to, uh, to let this sickle through. Of course, they have a lot of power and a lot of resources so they can do a lot in, in a short time. So you touched upon uh, investing in tobacco, uh, in the tobacco industry, and I remember that you worked uh, on with some students from Maastricht on uh, a project involving tobacco-free portfolios. So maybe what you want to discuss about that and share with us your work on the topic, as well as any other initiative that you're involved in, as to kind of uh, end the more technical questions. Yeah, the tobacco. Um... Uh, initiative is an interesting one. So uh, we are talking about COVID-19 right now, where uh, lots of people died and I think it's 250,000 at the moment. Because we had a lockdown, probably would have been millions if we wouldn't have had a lockdown. But every year also, I, if I understand correctly, millions of people die from tobacco across the globe. And we just let that happen. 
So, and um, I was inspired by a, by a radi radiation oncologist from Australia who started the back of free portfolios org so for people interested go there and then she asked me Rob you know when, whenever I go to investors like pension funds and I try them to try to convince them to uh, divest from tobacco they all agree on the ethical dimension just like I just said but they they have a, they have no clue about the financial dimension and then I said well I'm not a Nostradamus as well I cannot predict what the, what the tobacco industry is going to do generally people say tobacco stocks you get high dividends great returns, best investment you can do, low risk. So we have to buy that for in the interest of ourselves. So then with my students indeed, I, um, I did a, a study uh, that showed uh, in a sort of a scenario analysis environment that they will face tough times. If you look at the regulatory pressures, the political pressures, but also the pressures for the, from the public to, to especially in developed countries, so it seems that these tobacco companies are now steering towards emerging markets because there they can still interfere with, uh, with public opinion and maybe even uh, connect with the, the, the local authorities to, to make sure that they have some uh, demand over there. It's really bad, but uh, I think tobacco f stocks are a really grim future if you, you just invest in that. I think it's not a good thing in the long term. It may still give you high dividends in the short term, but at some point, it may be a failing industry. And the same has happened actually with the coal mine industry, coaling industry. Look at coal stocks of the last 10 years. We are all shunning coal. We don't want to invest in coal anymore. If everybody does that, the, the risk uh, premium goes up and price goes down of that, of these stocks. So as to kind of uh, wrap up the interview, uh, I'd like to ask you, given your expertise, your many years, working in the field of finance and sustainability. Um, we all know that in business schools, finance is a topic that is um, loved and uh, that many students want to get into. Um, what I want to ask is what are your tips, your uh, suggestions for students that want to work in finance, but at the same time have a strong interest in sustainability? Yeah. I think, um, so we had the same question in Maastricht. When we think about our education supply, we have to think, what do we want to give students? What, and, and what is demand for? Some you, sometimes you have to start with something to create a demand. And I think that's a good example of our sustainable finance master that we started, which actually is a normal finance master topped up with the sustainability question. So anybody starting with, with a career in this so I think it's absolutely wrong to just do finance and neglect sustainability. Even if you have a normal finance job, you will be in touch with sustainability topics constantly. You will have discussion with colleagues about the topics constantly, and then you don't have the arguments. You didn't think about it carefully. And you, you see that if you start discussing with really, let's say, a redneck on the topic, they use arguments like we used to have in the 25 years ago, which I had myself. You know, I was also taught in this area era of uh, uh, you know corporate finance that's the way to do it um, so you make these mistakes so I, I would even people who say you know it's not my topic but I want to be in mergers and acquisitions and go for it even there you need to know about sustainability so at some point in your curriculum either after your master or in your master you need to do the topic if you're interested in sustainable finance specifically then uh, I think you should definitely combine the two. So do not make the mistake to just do sustainability uh, and then with that go to finance because then you're not equipped to talk to these finance guys or women, of course, lots of guys, by the way, unfortunately. Um, and you don't have the arguments as well there. Then you come up with your sustainability story, but they don't listen to you. So I think I would definitely advise you and you don't have to do that in your master. You can also do the postgraduate courses. And of course, you can read a lot. There's a lot to read there, both at the academic level, but also books about this, this topic. So I would definitely advise you then to, to combine it and not to make the mistake to just do some uh, fake sustainability masters. And there are a lot of those. Uh, and, and then you want to work in finance. That's not the thing. If you want to work in management, maybe a good thing.
First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Bauer on behalf of all of GIA team for his time and availability for being here with us today. To all of you, I'd like to remind to keep an eye on our profiles. We have some new exciting content on sustainable finance coming up very soon in the upcoming weeks, so make sure you don't miss it. Bye!